The hatred for Caitlin Clark is so ingrained in women's college basketball and in women's college sports that the Women's Selection Committee did Iowa and Caitlin Clark and sports fans a huge disservice. Diversity, equity, and inclusion may ruin the women's NCAA basketball tournament. I'll explain. Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Monday. Thank you for joining me. Awesome show planned for you today. You guys need to start pounding that like and subscription button. If you're watching on YouTube, give me that five-star review. Uh, if you're listening over Apple, this episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Thank you uh, so much, Good Ranchers, uh, for rejoining the Fearless Army. Love you guys. Lo you guys need to love on uh, Good Ranchers for rejoining the Fearless Army. Get your meat and food from a place that loves you and loves your values. Uh, the other thing you can do, if you really love this show, is go to blazetv.com slash fearless, use the promo code fearless, and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription. Guys, I'm telling you, it's vital uh, that we support the Blaze. The Blaze and our great sponsors like Good Ranchers are why we're able to do this. Go to blazetv.com slash fearless, use my promo code fearless, uh, get your discount or subscription. It's important. Uh, let's get to uh, today's fire starter. <laughs> And it's a doozy. I'm going to, I'm going to irritate uh, a lot of people with this one, but it's the truth. DEI is the biggest threat facing Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes in the NCAA tournament. It's not Angel Reese or Juju Watkins or even Don Staley's undefeated South Carolina Gamecocks. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion. The allegedly anti-racist brainwashing policies and mindset that rule academia. DEI persuaded the 12-member NCAA selection committee to hand Clark and the Hawkeyes the most difficult Final Four path in women's basketball. The committee, Lisa Dickerson, Dorita Dawkins, Denise Barricado, Jill Bodensteiner, Jenny Bramer, Amanda Braun, Amy Folan, Alex Gary, Lizzie Gomez, Josh Heard, Jill Shields, and Lynn Teague. <laughs> place Clark in the same bracket as Kansas State, UCLA, and LSU, giving the second-ranked Hawkeyes the most difficult draw of the tournament. Now, Iowa has played Kansas State twice this year and three times in the past two seasons. The Hawkeyes have lost two of those three games. The four-seeded Wildcats feature arguably the best post player in the country in six-foot-six senior Aoka Lee. Iowa and Kansas State will likely meet in the Sweet 16. Both Iowa and Kansas State, because they're in the top 16 seeds, they both play home games, two home games, to advance to the Sweet 16. If the Hawkeyes somehow get past KSU, there's a good chance UCLA 6'7 Lauren Betts or LSU and Angel Reese will await them in the Elite Eight. LSU, of course, is the defending national champion. The Tigers beat Iowa in last year's title game. The Hawkeyes struggle with size and physical play. The selection committee stacked Iowa's region with big physical teams. This makes zero sense unless you understand diversity, equity, and inclusion. Before I connect all of those dots, let me add one more piece of context. Let's add, why is it important for Clark and Iowa to advance to the Final Four? It's obvious, but I'll explain. Clark has single-handedly carried women's college hoops to a place of unprecedented relevance and importance. She's the Tiger Woods of women's basketball. She's must-see TV. Television ratings for women's basketball 
have skyrocketed this year as Clark has chased scoring records and performed a female impersonation of Steph Curry. If Clark, Angel Reese, USC's freshman sensation, Juju, Juju Watkins, and coach Don Staley's South Carolina squad, if they all reach the Final Four, the women's Final Four would likely draw a bigger audience than the men's tournament. If Clark fails to reach the Final Four, the audience and relevance are cut in half, if not more. The selection committee should have drawn up brackets that made Dream Team's Final Four a possibility. You see what I did there? Dream Team's with an S, Final Four. That, would have, that should be a possibility. Instead, they focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is just a fancy configuration of words that means punish white people. Yes, Caitlin Clark, as you know, is white. Her coach, Lisa Bluter, she's white also. Most of Clark's teammates are white. Iowa is seen as the white Cinderella of women's college basketball. Liberal sports fans prefer Staley and or Reese over Clark. They don't want Cinderella making it back to the ball. USA Today published a piece about the importance of black players being the face of women's college basketball. A white woman wrote the article. You cannot rise as an administrator in women's college athletics without being a devout liberal and proponent of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can't rise virtually anywhere in corporate America without being a proponent of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it is even more true in academia on these college campuses. You can't get a position of authority, of oversight, of managing people without being a leader in the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement. The Women's Selection Committee is a confederacy of DEI-believing liberals. It's a group of athletics directors and deputy athletics directors who promote DEI. They demonstrate their anti-racism by being racist against white people. That's what DEI does. That's how Iowa received the toughest draw in the tournament. The well-intentioned selection committee bent over backwards, proving it did not favor Clark and Iowa. It did that by punishing Clark and Iowa. See how that works? See how DEI works? They would rather the women's tournament underachieve in terms of relevance than risk giving Iowa an easy path to the Final Four. Giving Iowa an easy path to the Final Four is what makes the most sense for women's college basketball. See, honestly, for women's college basketball, they should be tilting the scales in favor of Iowa. They have one shot here. Caitlin Clark is leaving for the WNBA, foolishly in my opinion, after this season. Women's college troops, they got one chance to cash in on Caitlin, Caitlin Clark and this whole phenomenon she set off. Yeah, she advanced to the championship game a year ago, but that run caught the public by surprise. We had barely heard of Clark last season. This year, she's been the biggest star in all of college athletics. She's 1979 Larry Bird and Magic Johnson rolled into a female package. Do you remember Bird and Magic? And the magic that they created and that carried on into the NBA? Women's College Hoops has that in Caitlin Clark. They could do what Magic and Larry did for college basketball and for the NBA and just for men's basketball in general. Do you know what a mess the NBA was before Magic and Larry? And, and UCLA, nice little story and all those titles John Wooden won. But Magic and Larry took the thing to the next level. That's what Caitlin Clark could do. Magic and Larry, they met in the NCAA championship game in 1979 and then took their acts to the, to the NBA. It would be an absolute tragedy if Caitlin Clark does not make the Final Four. Most of women's college basketball's establishment is rooting against Caitlin Clark. They're hardcore leftists. Clark is the wrong color. She's heterosexual. 
They have to root against what's in the best interest of the sport to stay loyal to their destructive diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. Many of the referees that will be officiating the women's games, they're slaves to DEI too. If I had to bet, Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes will get bounced from the tournament before the Final Four. That's my bet. That's my prediction. That's my fire starter. These idiots don't know what they have in Caitlin Clark. These idiots are no different than Cheryl Swopes, who said all that dumb stuff, or Caitlin Clark's 25, she's played five years, she jacks up 40 shots. How do you think Cheryl Swopes fixes her mouth, fixes her mind to say such ill-informed stuff? Because she's reflecting the mindset of all the people she's surrounded by. The women's basketball establishment does not like Caitlin Clark. They want Don Staley to be the face of women's college basketball every season. That's equity. That's equity. No one outside of South Carolina, outside of Columbia, South Carolina, really cares about Don Staley. There are people that in the media that fake like, oh, she's their queen and she's the great. But ain't nobody tuning in for Don Staley and that rough, physical, uncoached style of basketball that South Carolina plays. But that's who the establishment wants. She fits the profile. Caitlin Clark doesn't. These people, and I, I, I'm not... I'm not put, putting, this is the entire, this is white women, white men, and black people. This is the, the, the hatred, or the jealousy, or the envy of Caitlin Clark is pervasive throughout the women's college basketball landscape, throughout academia. She's a nice little story that they want to go away sooner rather than later. Rather than milk the benefit of her. They would rather destroy her. That draw makes no sense. And I know many of you are like, oh, well, I was going too far. How, how can you, do, blah, blah. Any of these teams that she could have played, they would all have been tough. It didn't matter. No. No, no, no. You play Kansas State twice already this season? You've played them three times in two years? And the people that put the brackets together? Yeah, yeah. That, that'll be a good Sweet 16 matchup for Caitlin Clark. Let's put them in the same region. Let's put them on a collision course in the round of 16. They, they have this Aoka Lee, six foot six, hell of a force, a senior at Kansas State, who clearly Iowa struggles against. Yeah, yeah, let, let's match them up in the Sweet 16. This is lunacy and stupidity. They should be fixing things the other way. That's what's best for the sport. But they want to end the Caitlin Clark hype. I, I, I'm sitting here and have been sitting here amazed. And, and I get that the WNBA, she gets to go play for the Indiana Fever, which is closer to, to Iowa, fits her personality better than if she waited next year and probably had to go out to San Francisco and play for the Golden State expansion squad. That, that doesn't, I, I get why she's going to the WNBA next year. But I would have done everything in my power, if I'm the WNBA and if I'm college basketball, to get this woman to stay another year in college hoops. I would let the Indiana Fever draft her this year and wait for her to come next year. Didn't the Boston Celtics do that with Larry Bird? Didn't they own his rights before he, he got to the NBA, you know, I, I would have cooked up something. And I wouldn't care. The NBA used to do this stuff all the time. The, the bent, I can, they wanted Patrick Ewing to play with the Knicks. The Pacers, my Pacers, were in that draft lottery. And they had the little bent card that ensured that the New York Knicks got Patrick Ewing. I was upset about it, but I didn't blame the NBA. Patrick Ewing at that time was the next big thing, and him going to New York made sense. 
They needed a strong franchise in New York. Caitlin Clark sticking around in women's college basketball. That's, that was what was best, and they should have paid this woman millions of dollars to stay. The television network should have got involved. Everybody should have got involved, but they don't do what's in their best interest. They want Caitlin Clark to go away, and they've rigged up an NCAA tournament, and then I, I just... The refs, they think no different than Cheryl Swopes. They think no different than this selection committee. They're tired of Caitlin Clark. We love her. Fans love her. Everybody's turning out to root for her or against her. They want her gone. That's my fire starter. We'll bring on Steve Kim here in a second. Uh, but before we do that, guys, I want to talk to you about our purpose. You know our purpose. Preborn, you know uh, how close preborn is, near and dear to our hearts. Uh, preborn is the number one supporter of our belief that life begins at conception. And not only do they believe that, they back it up. They back it up by providing expectant mothers who are considering abortion, they provide them with an ultrasound. They introduce that baby to the mother while the baby's in the womb. Ultrasound, heartbeat, images of that baby. Once that woman hears that baby's heartbeat, sees that image in the womb, she is now twice as likely to choose life. Preborn provides these free ultrasounds because we support preborn, because we know that life begins at conception, and there's nothing we could do better to support our worldview than support preborn. I've had Dan Steiner, the founder of Preborn, on this show multiple times. We know where our money goes. It doesn't go to pay mid-level executives overpriced six-figure salaries. It goes to pay for ultrasounds. It goes, because preborn doesn't stop once the baby's born. Preborn then, for the next two years, diapers, baby food, uh, strollers, anything a, a, a mother needs to support that baby, preborn for the next two years provides that so that that baby's start to life outside of the womb goes as well as when the baby is inside the womb. That's where our money goes. There's two ways to give to preborn. You can hit pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, say the keyword baby. Or you can go to preborn.com slash fearless. That's the way I like to give, preborn.com slash fearless. When you do, drop me an email, drop me a note. Love to get your emails about that. It inspires me. Make sure that I do great shows like this. This is our purpose, supporting preborn. Be a good fearless soldier. Support preborn. It's one of the great, greatest things you can do. It will make you feel better and good about yourself. And I like to feel good by supporting babies in the womb. All right, uh, <clears throat> before we get to Steve Kim, I want to tell you guys about uh, two special episodes of Fearless uh, coming this week. On Thursday and Friday, we're going to do a deep dive into Diddy and the shocking truth about hip hop. You guys have heard all the stories about the lawsuits facing P. Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs, Bad Boy Records, one of the guys at the top of the hip hop deal. We're going to go in depth on what Diddy really says and exposes about hip hop as a whole. This, this, you can get all else into is, is Diddy Jeff Epstein of hip hop? Is, is Diddy morally bankrupt? It's much bigger than that. Much bigger. We're going to go in depth on Thursday and Friday, two special episodes this Thursday and Friday. Don't miss it, Diddy, and the shocking truth about hip hop. Steve Kim, next. And fast food. I was never angry. In fact, I was happy. I didn't dwell much on our situation. I wasn't a victim. I had two parents who cared about me, 
My mother lived in Kansas City at the time. My parents had divorced. And I had a belief that things would get better. God was on my side. I say all that because poverty does not produce rage, a victim mentality, a lack of hope, the belief that the world owes you a debt, and the absence of parental love produce an endless supply of rage. The causes of what is ailing our children are obvious. It's the absence of a heavenly father and an earthly father. Those two fathers are the cure for the cancer of victimhood. It's really that simple. We should not be surprised by the savagery we're seeing from young people, whether it be school shootings or schoolyard fights. We poison the minds of children. We feed them a steady diet of video game violence, movie and TV violence, rap violence. Our schools tell them the suffering and sacrifice of our ancestors did not produce a better world, no. The errors of the past are unforgivable and the life sacrifices to atone for those errors are woefully insufficient. Retribution, AKA vengeance, and reparations, AKA debt, are the only adequate solutions. The solutions are antithetical to Christianity. They lead to rage and destruction. They lead to little girls beating, beating each other into comas and insane adults shrugging it all off as an inevitable consequence of kids fighting. Victimhood is a mental disease. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for our main man, or actually your main man, uh, the guy I have to tolerate, uh, Steve Kim, uh, the Korean co-cell, uh, is up next. Uh, I'll try to get through this next 30 minutes or so uh, for your benefit. You like him, I tolerate him. Uh, Korean Cosell, uh, welcome back to the show. Um, Steve, I'm arguing that it was intentional. This hard draw that uh, mm. Iowa has gotten is a byproduct of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that those liberal DEI athletic directors got in a room and was like, hey, <laughs> we got to prove that we're not pro Caitlin. And the best way to prove we're not pro Caitlin is give Caitlin the hardest path to the Final Four. No one can call us racist. And, and, and I authentically and truly believe that was part of the thinking. There's no reason in the world they should be playing Iowa for the third time this season and the fourth time in two years in the Sweet 16 round. This is a joke to me. Uh, your hmm. thoughts? Well, I'm not exactly Jay Billis when it comes to bracketology here, and I haven't studied this as much as you have, Jason. Uh, by the way, did you see where Jay Billis got his nails painted along with the Duke player on an ESPN? Uh, that just sickens me. Johnny Dawkins is probably rolling over in his grave. Mark Allery is disgusted. But with that being said, is it out of the realm of possibility that there was some sort of collusion going on to give the impression that, hey, there's no white privilege here. We don't want the wrath of the public. Look, I don't put anything past anybody at this moment. But it's mind-boggling that they would even do this. Let's say there's a shred of truth to this. Jason, let's be very honest about this. We've talked about it. Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes are the main draw. If they do not make the Final Four on that particular weekend, I would say the ratings would crash and dive like Enron stock in 2001. So if they actually get tripped up here before the Final Four, uh, let that be a lesson. But yeah, look, again, the possibility does exist given the world we live in. Steve, I think it's so subtle and... and, and that people don't even recognize that they're doing it, that they've been brainwashed into a way of thinking that they, they've they now normalized and they don't even realize what they're doing. I, I'm going to tell a story about someone I really respect, and I may have said this before on the show, but 
great athlete who I really, really respect. And he's now works as a college administrator in a DEI role. And, and I was having a conversation with him. We were at a football game and I think there was only one black cheerleader at this predominantly white school. And the guy said to me, man, it's a dang shame, you know, this school, they don't do a good enough job of telling the black students that these opportunities are even available. And, and I go, what? What? I go, it's 20, what, 2020 at this time, 2021, I can't remember. But I'm like, and you think they need to put special signs up around campus? that black girls can be cheerleaders or whatever. And I'm t this is a former great, great athlete who had one of the greatest competitive spirits of any athlete I've ever known. And I was like, hey man, your mindset has really changed. It's like when you were playing football, let's say, hypothetically, did the coach have to say, hey, there's a tackle available uh, you know, I just want to let you know as a black player that it's available for you to make tackles. Or did your competitive spirit just say, no, I'm going to go get that. Why are you telling these kids, you, you think we got to make special accommodations to black kids and say, there's an opportunity to be a cheerleader? I was like, dude, we had cheerleaders, back, black cheerleaders back when I was in college. But, but I'm just saying, this is how... I'm telling you, I watched someone who's one of the greatest competitors I've ever known. He's been running around in his DEI stuff for so long, he doesn't realize that it's changed his thinking. You know, that story right there, it brings to mind, it just got me to thinking. Remember that movie, Bring It On, with uh, Dwayne Wade's future yeah. uh, wife? Remember <laughs> that cheerleading movie? Uh, anyway, here's the thing. I would, I would, I would have asked that individual... Whoever that was, I would have, let me ask you something. Do you think it's more important to have a couple of more black cheerleaders or more of your black students in real fields of education where they can get a job instead of these degrees that mean nothing when they graduate? Uh, again, this is one of the problems I have with individuals in that particular field of DEI. They, they care about the wrong things. To, to me, if you really wanted to out go out there and plant a seed where black students can excel and you want more diversity, you have to get these students into real activities or real fields of education and degrees and not just extracurricular stuff. I don't believe it's all that important to have a couple of more black cheerleaders when in a lot of sports, the teams are predominantly black. Well, let's be honest. Nobody comes to a game to watch a cheerleader. They really don't. Uh, I don't know what to really say other than the fact that it's not important but here's the thing, those particular roles, they make the frivolous important and they do not actually care about what truly is vital in terms of moving along uh, things in a proper direction. Steve, the answer would be, well, no one's told the black student that real degrees are available to them at these universities. No. Degrees that, could, you know, we haven't, went down to their individual dorm rooms and said, hey, that African-American studies degree, you know, it's, it's great here on this college campus, but I don't think there are companies out there going, hey, uh, on this assembly line or on this architectural uh, design we're doing for some building or e th that your knowledge of African-American history doesn't make you more valuable there. So once again, it, it's the mindset is if black kids aren't spoon fed things, they will never uh, chase it, go after it, excel in it. And other people are looking out at the world saying it's filled with opportunities and I'm just going to go out and chase whatever it is that interests me. It, it, it's, and so I'm just, people will hear my mono and think I'm being far-fetched, but this is what diversity, equity, inclusion does to the mind 
it changes your whole way the world is perceived. And, and you literally start thinking, well, if I punish white people, I've done something good for black people. And, and, and I, 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 again, I, this will sound far-fetched, but because she's heterosexual and because she's white, I don't think Iowa, and I'm t <laughs> I sound crazy, but I really believe it. I don't think Iowa's gonna get a fair shake as a race to officiating, and I don't think they got a fair shake here in terms of tournament draw. I'll take your word for it. I'm probably not going to watch a single minute of either tournament. I'll be honest with you. We just keep it very, very, we keep it very honest here. Uh, although, if Iowa would make the final four and they played either LSU or South Carolina, here's what I'll do. You'll I'll be at JB's house. Timeline. You'll be at JB's no. house for the, for the watch party. Yes, you will. <laughs> Oh, you really think we're doing a women's college football palooza basketball? Yes. No. That, no, Let me just say this. If, no. If, if, well, LSU and Iowa can't both make it because they're in the same. But if South Carolina okay. and, and, and uh, Iowa meet in the championship game, I'll be at JB's house what? cooking apron and what? <laughs> for, the, oh. for the title party. Yes. Hold on, yes. hold on. Let's clip this. Yes. Hey guys, clip this segment out. Let's send this to Coach JB. <laughs> the, a bold proclamation has been made. Oh, you're really, wow. Okay, yes. and you'll you be there too the with bells on, wearing you your eye, wearing a Caitlyn jersey. <laughs> well, let's not go that far. Let's not go that far. I'll probably be wearing some of my <laughs> University of Miami gear because I look so good in it. But here's the thing. I, I will. You know what? If you're a man of your word, I'll be a man of my word. That if you show up to Coach JB's palatial estate, uh, I will be there. Now, I don't know how much of the game I'm actually going to pay attention to. But you know what? If you're there, I'm there. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. All right, we got a bet. Uh, I, and and if if I don't show up, I'm gonna get, I'll am gonna. i send you and JB both 1000 bucks each. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Until you actually take a selfie landing at the airport uh, I, yeah, you're not getting me anywhere. I'm going to tell you, I, I need actual proof that you're in the state of California in the southern part of it. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to give away his I'll resident. be there hosting the watch party, yeah. uh, probably yeah. cooking my world-famous fried chicken to go along with whatever else. Well, uh, that JB is so cooks. stereotypical. Uh, okay, I'll bring the tofu, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, let me take a second before we switch topics. I want to... Uh, take care of our great friends at Hillsdale. History, economics, the great works of literature, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. Did you study these things in school? Probably not. Or even if you did, maybe it's time for a refresher. Time and technology have changed a lot of things, but they have not changed basic fundamental truths about the world and our place in it. That's why I'm so excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subject. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses, all available for free. That's right, for free. I personally recommend you sign up for the ancient Christianity. In this 11 lecture course, you'll study the inspiring stories of Christ, his apostles, and the faithful ones throughout the first four centuries of Christianity. You'll also learn the arguments of the key early Christian apologists who defended the Christian faith, faith in the face of persecution. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Enroll now in ancient Christianity to discover the improbable and miraculous story of Christianity. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash fearless to enroll. That's hillsdale.edu slash fearless. There's no cost and it's easy to get started. One more time, hillsdale.edu slash fearless to register. Hillsdale.edu slash fearless. All right, uh, let's return to your number one guy, the person you believe is the star of this show, Steve Kim, uh, for some more conversation here. Steve, uh, Tom Cream made an interesting oh. point about the, uh, the men's bracket, which I, I, I can honestly say as I sit here right now, I have not looked at the men's bracket. 
I don't, oh, I, I think I know who the top seeds are. I've studied the women's bracket. Obviously, I've plotted a course <laughs> for Caitlin Clark in Iowa. I haven't looked at the men's bracket. I have seen the stories, though, that uh, some teams, big name teams that were left out of uh, the men's tournament have turned down the knit. And Tom Crean had an interesting take. Let's watch. Uh, there's no question about it. I would want to coach. I would want to develop my team. Uh, you've got bigger staffs than you've ever had. There's plenty of time for the portal. There's plenty of time to talk to recruits. There's plenty of time to negotiate NIL deals. There's not plenty of time to play. There's not plenty of time to get your players on the floor and give them a chance to get better. There's not plenty of time for guys to continue to play that may never get to play again. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is absolutely ridiculous. It's each coach's choice. I get it. But if you take away a chance to play the games, to put your team on the floor, mm -hmm. let them opt out. All right, the bowl season has it all the time. Let it happen. Who cares? Give your players and coaches a chance to keep coaching and playing, wow. and don't shortchange. If a guy doesn't want to play, go sit down. If a coach doesn't want to coach, go recruit. But there's got to be enough people to put five, six, seven people on the floor and go play. Makes absolutely zero sense to me. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I, I think he makes a heck of a point about mm. what's been done to the competitive spirit. Yeah. In college athletics, we see it at the professional level in the NBA. You know, guys complain about playing 65 games, load management. Uh, now we're seeing, we've seen it in college football where guys don't want to be, I may get hurt in bowl season. We're not playing for the national championship. Now it's all the way here in college basketball where teams, St. John's, Indiana University, a bunch of big name schools like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to skip the knit. What's been done to college athletics? Someone needs to do a documentary. And just what's been done to athletics as it relates to competition, we just don't value it anymore. Jason, here's my reaction. And I, and I, I like to save these for special occasions. Slow 80s clap. <laughs> Slow 80s clap. Crane rules everything around me. I, I, look, here's, I know there's going to be people that disagree with them, That's but you know good. what I respect about that, whether you agree, disagree, or you know, agree with some of it, not all of it. I respect the fact that he just said, this is how I feel. I don't care if you think I'm out of touch. I don't care if you think I'm an older white guy who shouldn't be so bold, who wants the old days. And back in my day, we walked five miles in the snow, backwards up a hill to get to school. We have so many people in our field, Jason, of sports journalism at any level, they're afraid to tell the truth or how they truly feel without a filter and say, you know what? I don't care how you feel. This is what I'm going with. Rip me all you want, but they don't want the blowback. And the fact that Tom Crean flat out said, you know what? I'm going to say something unpopular. These guys should play. And if they don't play, I completely respect that. There used to be a time that if you were a big name program and you did not make the big dance, the March Madness, and you were in the not in tourney, you know what? Basically, you said, OK, you know what? We're going to have to do what we do. We're going to play basketball. It's our last chance to be together as a group. And the coaches said, you know what? We're going to be professionals about this. And it's interesting that Tom Crean, once coached at Indiana, didn't work out for him. I didn't realize this until I read Season on the Brink by John Feinstein last year. Jason, did you know that even after the season, if Indiana got eliminated before the Final Four, that there was still a window of time that coaches could still practice with their teams legally? And you know what Bobby Knight would do? He would tell the guys after getting eliminated, let's say the second, third, or Sweet 16, they'd say, okay, guys, um, we still have a couple of weeks here to practice. I'll see you Monday. Be at practice. Randy, you would practice hard. I'm not expecting that to happen anymore. It's way too soft. But I happen to agree with Tom Crean, but I really, really respect the fact he let his words go without a filter and said how he felt, because that is really all too uncommon in today's journalism and broadcasting. Here's what name, image, and likeness and the, the hyper, hyper focus on postseason has done. It's eliminated school pride. Yeah. Uh, name, image, and likeness, and in combination with the transfer portal, ha have 
eliminated the connection athletes used to have with their school and I'm representing my school and I'm playing for school pride. And it, not all the kids had that, but enough of them did. And I sit here today as a 56 year old man with Ball State tatted across the front of this shirt. And, and, and I, I don't, the way the system is now, kids jumping from school to school and, and all having been convinced that the school was exploiting them and using them. And so the kid, it, to me, when I look at teams saying, nah, we're good, and coaches saying, nah, we're good, we're not going to play anymore, it speaks to how hard it is to actually coach and motivate kids in this new environment. And, well, and, and that, again, Nick Saban's walked away. Jay Wright has walked away in college basketball. Nick Saban, obviously, in college football. And, and you're seeing coaches now just like, man, it's hard enough for me to motivate these guys and get them to do anything I say. Uh, and I certainly can't get them to do it during the knit. And so we're going to just pass. Jason, I, I've heard a lot of athletes that have said my best times were in college. I love my teammates. It was the funnest time I ever had. And I would love to play another game with them. These guys are now turning it down, but that's the difference between a mercenary and a soldier. Mercenaries fight battles for a price. Soldiers win war out of pride and honor for a cause. We don't have that anymore. Um, that, that is the truth. And you talk about doing a documentary at what is happening to college sports, I think the title should be Nil and Void. It's because of this alongside the transfer portal that has killed a lot of what made college sports unique and fun. Now we just have a bunch of part-time athletes, not part-time, but let's say semester to semester students who no longer have ties that really bond with that school and maybe there is a reality. Maybe as soon as these guys get eliminated from their conference tourney, who only got 12 minutes a game, maybe they don't want to play another game for that said program and are already looking for an escape hatch. But that's the reality they created. And the reality, unfortunately, a lot of it, Jason, is anarchy. So let me connect it to Deion Sanders. And, and I knew you were going to do this. Talk a little college football. I'm going to connect it to Deion Sanders in college football, right up your alley of expertise. Th this is why I'm expecting this season at Colorado to be worse than last what? season. And yes, they oh. finished in last place in the Pac-12 last year. But, but expectations are so high, they don't have to finish in last place in the Big 12. But, but I'm saying winning five or six games is a possibility at Colorado because once they get to loss number two and they're eliminated from the playoff scenario, that team will be completely uncoachable and in total chaos, and every mm. game after that will be very losable because everything is about making the college playoffs. There's not, nothing going on in Colorado has anything to do with pride in the university and, and some overall record or winning the Big 12 Conference. Everything's about national championship or bust. And so when they get to loss number two, it's going to be chaos. Keep this in mind, Jason. I don't think this year's Big 12 will be as deep or as good as the Pac-10 and what was their uh, swan song. But they're, look, I think that dynamic, Jason, does not just apply to Colorado. There are a lot of schools no that loaded up on transfer portal in the NIL, and it's a house of cards that you're right. When you start getting lost two and three, guys start looking around going, what are we doing here? I don't even want to be here. And if they don't get the playing time, there could be dissension. But I expect Colorado to be a little bit better, though. I'd have to examine their roster fully. I haven't really started that part yet. But they did fortify their front line. They got the number one offensive tackle in the country, who I'm assuming is not going to redshirt. Uh, Travis Hunter is still outside. Shador Sanders is a frontline college quarterback. So I don't know. We'll see. I'll have to examine that a little bit more. But, Jason, to be fair, what could happen at Colorado, what you're forecasting, could actually happen at a lot of programs across the country. No question about it, Steve. I want to keep it moving. Uh, I want to know your thoughts on Justin Fields 
basically forcing the Bears to trade him to Pittsburgh. He mm -hmm. wanted to go to Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm sure this is according to NFL Network's Ian Rappaport says Fields wanted to go to Pittsburgh, blocked other trade attempts. Uh, I'm sure Pittsburgh was probably honest with him, like, hey, we're also going to make a move on a one-year deal with Russell Wilson. But, but what do you make of the Bears trading Fields at this point and Fields' desire to go to Pittsburgh in conjunction with Russell Wilson being there on a one-year deal? What's interesting about any and all of this? Well, Jason, my understanding is I read this on one of the tweets from one of the NFL insiders that they made it clear, hey, Russell Wilson right now is our starter. There's really not going to be a competition. And if Justin Fields is okay with that, and in essence, is going to take a redshirt year to restart and reset his career. Jason, I'm not all that against it. I kind of sort of like the move. I don't think Justin Fields, I'm not going to say he didn't get a fair shot because he got a lot of snaps. They had no help outside. You look at the Bears' skill position um, rooms, not very good. I would say below average by NFL standards. Jason, this brings to mind, and I am not forecasting a couple of Super Bowls. Remember old Jim Plunkett, number one pick in the early 70s out of Stanford by the New England Patriots? He was an, I don't want to say an absolute bust, but he got beat up in New England. Then, he, then it didn't work out in San Francisco. And Al Davis said to Jim Plunkett, Jim, I want you to be an uh, Oakland Raider, but here's the thing. We are not going to play you the first year or two. You're actually going to sit on the bench. You're going to rest. You're going to rehabilitate your mind and body. And then in 1980 and 83, he led them to Lombardi trophies. I'm not saying this is going to happen to Justin Fields, but there is a bit of a precedent for this. I mean, look, hold on. It's been about a couple months since we brought up Rich Gannon. I think it's time we restart that. Rich Gannon, in the beginning of his career, was kind of an off-and-on guy, thought of as a backup, and no one actually ever thought he could really play, but eventually he stuck around, got in the right situation, and Jason, he won an MVP and led the Raiders to a Super Bowl berth. It's my memories a tiny is too fuzzy as it relates to Jim Plunkett. Of course, I remember those Super Bowls and watched them and remember Jim Plunkett. But Rich Gannon obviously did a stint in Kansas City right before going to Oakland or to the Raiders, wherever they were playing yes. at that time. I think Oakland. Uh, it was Oakland. And, and so I'm very familiar with Rich Gannon's story and narrative. And so, but what you got to remember about Rich Gannon is he landed with John Gruden. Yes. And, and uh, Justin Fields is landing with Mike Tomlin, a defensive coach, whereas uh, Rich Gannon landed with an offensive-minded coach. And, and Pittsburgh's offense, for ever since Ben Roethlisberger exited his prime, maybe ever since A.B. A. B. forced his way out or you know, bad behavior his way out of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's offense has been a struggle. And so yeah. I just don't know if Justin Fields is landing in the a similar situation as Rich Gannon with an offensive-minded coach and franchise. That it's an interesting decision that he wanted to go play in Pittsburgh, and he's doing it knowing he's going to sit behind Russell Wilson in year one. Yeah, and Jason, this is an interesting dynamic now. Does that mean the Bears are now targeting Caleb Williams? Because I, I, I don't know. I'm an old school guy. I, look, to me, his, his Twitter emoji should be one big red flag, honestly. The way he behaves. Here's the problem with if you're the Bears. See, I thought the Bears were better off keeping fields maybe or getting another one of those quarterbacks, but making sure somehow with one of those picks that you have in the first half of that first round, you got to get Marvin Harrison. Because that guy looks like he's going to be a perennial thousand yard receiver at the next level. Something that the Bears have not had for a very long time, or certainly not during the run of Justin Fields. Now, Here's the problem with Caleb Williams to anyone that drafts him. Number one, if he doesn't want to be there, you're looking at a five-year run. When I draft a quarterback, number one, Jason, uh, regardless of how they play, because that'll be figured out, I want that guy to say at the press conference, hey, I'm glad to be here. I can't wait to be your franchise quarterback for at least the next dozen years. 
I don't want to hear all this other stuff. Well, I'm going to need ownership of the team if I'm going to stick around. And I don't know. My, my mom's going to need this and a visor to cover. I, there's just so many things. If I am the Bears, again, I would put that number one pick up for ransom. and say, look, if you want to draft that guy, go ahead. Give us more draft capital because let's be realistic about the Bears. They are more than just a player or two away from contending for anything. You just reminded me before I move on to the next topic. You just reminded me. I was talking about Caleb Williams and and me thinking about him painting his fingernails. I need you to elaborate again. I didn't know this about Jay Billis. What happened there? He did this on TV. There was there's some Duke player. I don't know his name because I I don't watch basketball anymore. But I, I guess his thing is he gets his fingernails painted. So I saw something on one of these YouTube channels. I wish I could give them credit. So they did a segment where him and Billis are getting manicures and getting their nails painted. And I'm looking at this going, my God, Christian Leitner would never. Mark Allery would never. (laughs) I I mean, look, I get it. You can do the feature on it. But when Billis is like this, oh, my God. And here's the thing that was really insulting. They didn't even use Asians to do the manicure. Hey, this is our thing. <laughs> this is what we do. But anyway, God, I, I don't know. I like I, I, Jay Billis, not a great look, bro. Just not a good look. Everybody wants to be relatable now. No one wants yeah. to be, uh, you know, wise and an authority. For Everybody wants to be relatable. See how young and hip I am and yeah. ESPN give me a new contract because I can reach the young kids. I'm relatable. Uh, l- let me move on. Jalen Rose uh, hmm. has said that the NBA should retire the number 23 in honor of Michael Jordan. And and part of his reasoning was, because the first half of it, I kind of got it, like, okay, honor Michael Jordan. And then he said part of his re- reasoning should be because MJ is so popular such that folks are shooting and killing for his kicks. Wow. And I mean, this was a string of, of <laughs> tweets. And it's like, well, he's so popular, kids are killing themselves for his shoes. Uh, that means we should uh, uh, retire his number uh, across all the NBA. I, 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 I disagree with this. Just the retirement, take Rose's justification out of it. I, I, I disagree with it. I, I get why baseball did it for 42 with Jackie Robinson. Jackie yeah. Robinson uh, dealt with a lot crossing the color barrier and is, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, other than dealing with the Detroit Pistons, <laughs> you know, and not that his path was easy. He, you know, he's a great player. I don't think his significance goes beyond being a great player. And so when you start talking about retiring a number across the board, uh, it, it just it doesn't make make sense to me, but it's just like it's all part of this whole elevation of and debate between Jordan and LeBron and just like what's the next level we can say that I can prove that I'm a Jordan guy and not a LeBron guy. Oh, they should retire Jordan's number across the board and and now every athlete uh, gets a statue. Anyway, your thoughts on whether. NBA should retire the number 23. Well, first of all, Jason, I agree with you. When it comes to Jackie Roosevelt Robinson, he's a historical icon. It went far beyond sports. While Michael Jordan is still incredibly popular and famous, but the impact and what they did for their respective sports in the country, uh, retiring 42, I thought, was much more proper than retiring 23. Now, look, you know me. um, As someone who was a non-Bulls fan who grew up loving the Lakers, and was a Magic Johnson, Michael Cooper, James Worthy, Kareem guy, I'm as big a Jordan admirer as you can get, okay? But with that said, I I don't disagree with you. Here's the thing, Jason. As much as we admire and now have a newfound respect for Jordan, guys like you, there are certain cities like Detroit, New York, and Indiana, and Milwaukee who were tortured by Jordan and were were kept from NBA titles after a certain point in time, after 1991, and even Utah, they don't want anything to do with the 23 being retired because of that guy. And I always believe this, outside of Jackie Robinson, 
Numbers being retired should be for players who wore your uniform. Bottom line. And by the way, speaking of the dynamic of the shoes being robbed, stolen, and murders being committed um, because you wanted those shoes. I remember Vice Network about three years ago did a two-hour documentary on this whole subject. I think it was called A Man and His Shoes. And it's always mystified me. And obviously, Vice, being who they are, took a political stance. People like Jamel Hill was on it, so you know what direction it went. I've always been amazed that it was Michael Jordan's fault that there's a breakdown in culture and people are robbing each other of footwear. I've never understood that. Yeah, it's not Michael Jordan's fault. (laughs) It's a breakdown in families. Fault, yeah. but we don't want to talk about that. So it's easier to blame uh, Michael Jordan. It's 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 crazy. Uh, Steve, last thing I want to get to a humorous uh, topic or something I found humorous. Uh, did you see in this Raptors Orlando Magic game last night? Uh, Grady Dick and Anthony Black, two rookies. Uh, Grady actually, I think, starts. For the Raptors and Anthony Black comes off the bench, plays very little for the Magic. Uh, They did a jersey swap. Let's watch. Rookies Anthony Black and Grady Dick. One from Arkansas, the other from Kansas. Exchanging jerseys. Uh, Obviously, you see the double entendre there. Uh, one jersey says black, the other one says dick. I contend that the broadcast crew and the broadcaster are in on the joke. They knew exactly what was going on here. Anthony Black played three minutes at the end of a blowout game. And, you know, Grady Dick started, I believe. But their jersey swap, why does it have to be broadcast on TV unless you know that an inside joke is going on. Yeah, I I mean, Jason, the whole, and I hate the jersey swap. I I really do. Um, Wasn't the jersey swap originally, I'm not so sure when this became a regular thing, wasn't it about two iconic players at the top of the field, like two Hall of Famers, let's say Larry Bird and Dr. J, who, by the way, never did that, um, swapping jerseys as a measure of respect, like, hey, we're all-time greats, and you know what? We're getting out of here. Now you got mediocre players doing this. I mean, this would be like in the 80s if the Lakers played the Celtics. It would be like Mike Smrek uh, exchanging jerseys with David Thirdkill. Okay? And by the way, look those names up. I think they did play at the same time. I I don't get this. Um, I'm just, I look, I'm just going to be very suspicious and look out. I'm going to check all the rosters. Make sure there is no player in the NBA with the last name Booty and another one whole, because now at that point, you're going to get all these things. If this may be the story, be sexy red will do the national anthem. It, it, that would actually make sense. That would actually make sense. But yeah, I don't, look, look, this is another reason why, and I don't want to go all Coach JB here, but but the jersey swap, especially in a regular season game, it's not the end of the season. I, I don't get it. I don't like it. And quite frankly, I get it. I'm the old, crabby, irascible Asian Andy Rooney. And Jason, the great thing is, I'm not changing. <laughs> uh, Steve, before we let you go, I want to tell you mm-hmm. about uh, special episodes of of uh, Fearless that are going to be on Thursday and Friday. I want your take. I want to know if you want in on this discussion. Uh, but uh, this Thursday and Friday, we're going to do two special episodes, Diddy and the Shocking Truth About Hip Hop. I'm going to take... Uh, the the P. Diddy lawsuits and explain to you how they fit in to the overall narrative and what the real purpose of hip hop is. These are, you know, the NCAA tournament's going to be going on on Thursday and Friday. So we're going to counter program. We're not going to talk sports on Thursday and Friday. We're going to talk about hip hop and the shocking truth about hip hop and what Diddy, these allegations against Diddy, what they really mean and signify. Uh, I think it's going to be very special program. If you care anything about hip hop, you're going to want to watch these two shows. Uh, does this interest you? Is is this something you might be? Because I'll probably do a reaction show. I'll unpack all these uncomfortable truths and do a little reaction 
show and, and consult with you and Shamika and maybe Delano about uh, what I unpack and what I uncover about hip hop and Diddy? Um, this is what I have to say about hip hop. I think at one point during our younger years, when we were much younger, Jason, that genre of music was very positive and message driven. I think it was much more conscious. I mean, there used to be songs. I remember Houdini did one about don't get into drugs. Uh, Public Enemy, Night of the Living Baseheads, they gave a warning about the crack academic um, that was going on in various cities. And they used to warn about it. And they used to, in their own way, they weren't Nancy Reagan, but they would say, hey, just say no, be very careful of this. Now the performers push it on young kids. And there came a point where I said, you know what, this is not worth it. It really wasn't. And then I really got dismayed around the late 90s when it became East Coast, West Coast, Death Row, Bad Boy. I thought it signaled something that was very dangerous. Then you had that famous magazine cover on Vibe, which was almost like a call to arms, it seemed like. And at that point, I said, you know what? I'm just going to listen to my old cassettes of Curtis Blow. I'm good. Um, I don't have to act tough. I'm just a suburban guy that happens to like certain songs. But in my view, unfortunately, when it comes to modern day rap and hip hop, it is now basically a net negative for our society. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. So that's Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Great job. Uh, hey, guys, uh, I watched an interesting uh, documentary this weekend uh, about the Texas border standoff. Join Jason Buttrell and the Blaze Originals team on a road trip with the Take Our Border Back convoy to the front line of the border crisis as they uncover what was really happening during Governor Greg Abbott's fight against federal agents. Our team reveals the story the mainstream media didn't want you to know. Jason and the Blaze Originals team found an alarming way around the Texas National Guard border blockade to show viewers at home what is really going on. Media coverage of Eagle Pass painted an alarming picture of what's going on at the border, but the truth is worse. From a conservative estimate, five and a half million people have illegally crossed into the United States in the last 36 months, an all-time high. Blaze Originals reveals that the elites on the left, the right, and in the media all have something to gain from the border crisis and why those interests make it near appear impossible to actually solve the problem. The mainstream media's narrative didn't pan out on the Eagle Pass crisis, and the Blaze Original team shows why. Go to blazeoriginals.com and use the promo code BORDER to get $30 off your Blaze TV Plus subscription. Finally, guys, make sure you're making plans uh, to come join us right here in Nashville on Saturday, June 1st, the Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0. Go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com to reserve your spot today. TJ Moe and a discussion about Gilbert Arenas and <laughs> Trayvon Diggs. Next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the most high. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R 
responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. All right, let's roll out to uh, St. Louis and bring in the show me kid, TJ Moe. Uh, TJ, have an interesting topic for us to discuss. Uh, Gilbert Arenas, the former NBA star, uh, put out a video uh, basically giving advice to young women who aspire to be NBA groupies and hoes on how they should go about it and how, how much money they can make. And, and so we're going to play that clip, but in addition to that, Trayvon... Uh, Trayvon Diggs, um, who is the brother of Stephon Diggs, who plays, Trayvon plays corner for the Dallas Cowboys. He just had his third baby by a woman 10 years older than him. She's his third baby mama. Between the two of them, they have seven kids by seven different partners. She, the, the woman who just got pregnant, she has babies by two rappers, Bow Wow and Future, and now she has a baby by an NBA, uh, NFL star in Trayvon Diggs. <clears throat> I, I'm combining these two together, and let, let's, let's first, let me play the clip of, of Gilbert Arenas advising a young woman on how to be a better 304, which is the cold word for a hoe. Uh, in, anyway, let's play the Gilbert Arenas clip. Listen, for all my future 304s. Yes, tell them. And this is going to sound, but I'm just going to put you on game. All right, let's say, how many dudes, what's the average? A Birkin, not a Birkin the yeah. first thing. No, what, 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 what is the average, what is the average girls per year? Like, how many dudes have you slept with one year? Gil ain't gonna buy a burke in the first night. No, no, no. Don't let Gil lie to you. Well, he no, two, might. Three. Gil got the, he had the hundred. So, he so two, three. So, the so the average. No, what's the average? Like a girl, a dude. Like how many dudes is she in one year? See, it depends like three, where the money at. Four. Gil got. All right, the so let's say let's just say say four. So if you four dudes a year or three dudes a year, I'm telling you from the ages of probably what, eighteen to thirty five, treat it like a business. Get you some NBA players. Let them in, them three NBA players. Think about it. The NBA player on the lowest end, on the brokest in the NBA, yeah. he gonna pay you about five grand a month just to fuck with you. Five grand a month. So if you got three of them, that's fifteen grand a month just on the bottom end. Now you talking about you got like a James Harden, a mother, Paul George or something, <laughs> or, or me? Heels, yeah. You you talking about just around with you, you talking about 10, 20 grand a month just to be cool. And you might have to sleep with dude maybe twice a month, three times a month, right? With those dudes, three times a month, depending. You making 60 grand a month. What job, what education you going to get from the ages of 20 to 35 that's going to that? pay you 60 that's grand not, that's a month. That's, that's not, not a realistic. Job. Like, what the fuck? That's not what, realistic. That's a job. Like, What's going So, uh, hold for one second before I bring TJ in the conversation. I just want to provide more context because some of this is outside TJ's area of expertise. 
Uh, and I say that respectfully and affectionately. But what Gilbert Arenas is describing is, is commonplace in athletic circles, in the entertainment industry, and anywhere young men or even middle-aged men have great, great wealth. And so I want everybody to, we're going to have a conversation about Gilbert Arenas. We're going to have a conversation about Trayvon Diggs. But, but this week, when I saw that this weekend, I'm like, man, this, this Gilbert Arenas is a father. His son is headed towards the NBA. I believe his son is ranked the fourth best prospect in his draft class. I think his son's still in high school. Uh, and so I'm like, a father is talking this way. His son's headed towards the NBA. This is the wisdom that's being passed on by a father. And, and, but then I had to be more realistic and say, Gilbert Arenas knows the environment of the NBA, knows the environment of young people with lots and lots and lots of discretionary income. And then I think after I saw this clip, I'm on my Stairmaster and I'm like, man, because I like to watch movies when I'm on my Stairmaster, it distracts me, lets me go longer. And so I put in I, on Amazon, I was like, I own The Wolf of Wall Street. Haven't watched it in years. It came out in 2013. And I'm looking at what The Wolf of Wall Street is saying about because it's based on a true story, this Jordan Belfort, if you haven't seen it, his stockbroker on Wall Street that was making, I think at the peak, he was making 49 million bucks a year. Uh, he had a little penny stock scam that he grew into this, you know, basically illegal stock trading deal or whatever. And it's a celebration of all the sexual debauchery and all the drugs and everything that's commonplace in uh, in Wall Street, guys making tons and tons of money. If you remember early on in the movie, Matthew McConaughey plays a character at some brokerage firm that's advising uh, Jordan Belfort or Leonardo DiCaprio's character on you know coke and and jacking off and prostitutes and all this other stuff. And 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 then I started thinking about. Uh, the TV show Entourage as well, another show I used to love and have rewatched. And I think about all the sexual debauchery and promiscuity that that promotes. And so the culture that Gilbert Arenas is, is representing here, he's just being more transparent about it than most people are comfortable. But, but he's not representing a culture that's particularly unique to athletics or the NBA. He's talking about a pervasive culture of sexual promiscuity and sexual uh, financial relationships, putting women on payroll, seeking arrangements or uh, sugar daddying that, that's pervasive. And, and I can't sit here uh, as a journalist who covered sports in a real way and covered athletes and people with a lot of money, young people with a lot of money, and act like what Gilbert Arenas is saying, it's mostly true. He's being transparent, or not all the way true. He's being transparent. As a father, do I think he should be that transparent? and know that my son is listening? No, I don't. But Gilbert Arenas basically to me is explaining that unintentionally, that all of these young people with money in athletics, all, we should clearly just take them off of the pedestal. They're not role models, they're not appropriate influencers for kids. They're young idiots with money and free time, and this is what they do with their money and free time. And he called out names, and people, people will either ignore this or they're going to take a dump on Gilbert Arenas and pretend like, oh, my God, he's just a trick or he's, uh, 
he, he's a snitch or, or whatever. He's actually being unintentionally helpful and very transparent. We need to understand who these athletes are and who these people are that have gobs and gobs of discretionary money. And it's why the Bible says it'll be easy that for a rich man to make it into heaven, a camel has a better shot of going through the eye of a needle than a rich man making it into the kingdom. And this is why. Too much money, too much free time, too much discretionary income, too much power, too much temptation. They can't resist it. And so when Charles Barkley said years and years ago, I'm not a role model, I think part of what he was saying was a truth that he didn't put all the details on because he can't, it was a Nike commercial, but he's like, if you knew what rich celebrity athletes actually did and do in reality, you would not look at me as a role model. I can't be your role model. I'm way too flawed. I'm a rich man who, again, a camel has a better shot at getting through the eye of a needle than I do of being some sort of good role model for your kids. And this is pervasive. We can reduce it just to athletes and say, look at the athletes and what bad guys. But if we're really real and honest, all these super wealthy elites, and particularly the ones that take the Wall Street guys, take the actors and musicians in Hollywood, this is all unearned wealth. And what I mean by unearned, we should not be paying people that can dribble a basketball or throw a football or hit a golf ball millions upon millions of dollars. It's unearned. They're not worth it. Yes, do they entertain us? Do they contribute anything to society? No. Does the guy on Wall Street that comes up with some algorithm or just games the system or, as Jordan Belfer exp explains in Wolf of Wall Street, tricks people out of their money? Why does that guy need to be making a million dollars a year? I mean, a month. Why? We're giving people that don't really contribute to society too much money. Musicians, actors, what do they really contribute? Nothing. They're installed. They're not doing something valuable. They're not teaching our kids. We're giving them gobs and gobs of money, treating them as if they're influencers and role models. It's all a mistake. Given that context, uh, I want to now bring TJ into the conversation. TJ, I'm sorry for uh, making you wait that long, but I just wanted to provide a little context. And then I, I, I want your thoughts on Gilbert Arenas, Trayvon Diggs, my argument that all of these people making all of this money, they're unfit to be placed on the pedestal that we have them on. Yeah, I think that's right. And Gilbert Arenas giving out advice. He's a guy who uh, actually was honest that he used to spend $80,000 a year on having pet sharks in his house. So this guy's discernment is not great. I mean, he had fish tanks. and This is what athletes do with money. You and I were both athletes, uh, spent, guy, spent time around professionals. Um, you certainly did probably a lot more time than I did as a journalist. These aren't like our best and brightest. And the idea that we should listen to them for, for even athletic advice, to be totally honest, because some of them go, give good athletic advice, but a lot of them are just so physically gifted. It's like, yeah, I got here because I'm 6'6", six, six, and I got a rocket arm. So, yeah, good, better luck next time. You know, it's, I, I remember as a kid trying to look up as much information as I could about these guys and hoping they could give me some sort of advice. And occasionally I did. But it was really the coaches who did, and that's what I figured out later. These athletes just don't have – much to offer. And I was one of those athletes. And, and just to be totally frank, I didn't have much to offer when I was playing. Truly, my, the, my personal development has come almost entirely after I put down a football. That's, put down a football, pick up the Bible, put down the football, pick up any book, read a history book, read, you know, anything. And so 
I think I think these guys. Um, you and I have had this conversation. It, it was related to uh, Mike Todd sermon actually, and he was it was uh, talking about manna, right? And he was like, yeah, I don't know, it was maybe it was a cuffing season, cuffed him, something like that. And you pointed out, as somebody that's made a lot of money, that money makes you feel like you don't need God, because you got a problem. You can hire the best doctors in the world and you're never hurting for your next meal and you can buy your way out of a- any altercation. You have, if you got a big company and somebody sues you, eh, 10 million bucks, that'll shut them up. And you, money can solve all your problems. It's actually, I heard this from a real estate guy that I do respect, but it's, you know, looking at it, uh, it's, it's not the way you should approach life. If you got a problem and money can solve it, you don't have a problem. That's something he lives by. I'm like, mm, I wouldn't live by that, man. This is this is how you find yourself in a place where, look, do you like pet sharks better that you're willing to spend eighty thousand dollars on, or sex with beautiful women better? And, and we expect that these guys aren't willing to pay for that, and particularly being willing to pay for them to shut up about it, because that's really what they're paying for. It's not the sex. It's hey, this is an agreement that you'll never come after me and say I did something to you, and also you won't tell anybody. I don't like it. It's this is pervasive and across the board, and it will sound like I'm just taking a dump on athletes and I don't like athletes. It's just not true. I used to be a mediocre mid major athlete, and I've certainly have been at the top of the sports journalism profession for close to 30 years, having analyzed, studied, been friends with, followed. Uh, athletes for three decades now. And so having been a stupid athlete, and I'm talking about when I was in college, the level of dumb that I was, I, it's, it's, I'm really, you know, in old age, it's really hammered and, and really uh, helped me understand just how stupid I was and how privileged I was because I was tolerated because I could play football so well that the coaches dealt with things that just are mind boggling. It just, just how, how stupid I was, but, but and, and I wasn't even, you know, clearly wasn't the most talented guy on the team, but I had a lot because at the ball state level, because nobody else would have dealt with what I offered up. But, but more than that, what I'm saying is the system we've devised, doesn't allow athletes to be good influences. It, it just doesn't. It, it, there's too much money, there's too much worshiping, there's too much butt kissing, there's too much tolerance of their imperfections for these guys to be any sort of role model or anybody we should listen to. And, and I'm sorry, I know some, oh, LeBron James, he opened a school and LeBron, no, 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 no. He, he's, he's an idiot. And I say that affectionately, having been an idiot, uh, and and he's in a he's surrounded by other athletic idiots, and 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 so he's the tall. You know, I don't even think he's the tallest midget among athletes because there are actually some athletes of Jonathan Isaacs, and some of them actually have a modicum of intelligence. But when you throw all the money and the worship and the adulation and the lies that are told to them by everybody, they're just not equipped uh, to be any type of influencer. And, and, and I connect all of that to, again, same thing I'd say about guys on Wall Street that are making 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year. Same actors and singers, whether it be rock and roll, whether it be rap, there's just different level. It's all an idiot scale. Some of them just are a little less stupid than others, but they're all stupid. From Jimmy Kimmel, he's no more or less bright than LeBron James. He may have better diction, but, but his worldview is skewed by all the money that he's made. And, and, and so I, I, I say all that uh, to say we really need to come out of this mindset that these guys have anything more important to offer us other than a jump shot or a tackle. And, and, and I know that that will infuriate probably some people that are friends of mine in the athletic world, 
but it's just the truth and we have to come to grips with that. If we put these guys in the proper perspective and just literally ignored them, not shut up and dribble, they don't have to shut up. We just need to ignore them because what Gilbert Arenas is talking about is the typical mindset of an athlete. And I'm not saying every athlete does what Gilbert Arenas is talking about, but a high percentage of them do. Yeah. And, and what I mean by a high percentage, I'm talking about 50%, 60% on some level do some sort of behavior similar, maybe even 70%. Uh, <laughs> to what <clears throat> Gilbert Arenas is talking about. And then there's this other 20 or 30% or that maybe dabble in it, know what's going on, say nothing. Uh, but, but you just, my level of understanding of the world has increased immensely since I started surrounding people, surrounding myself with people who talk about a biblical worldview all the time. And if you're in a locker room where everybody's talking about money, 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 and what can be bought with money, and what jewelry, and what cars, and that's your conversation, con you're just not gonna be very smart. Yeah, right, so uh, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. These guys are hanging out with blocks of wood. You know, and it, and look, I've 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 been around those blocks. I was a block of wood, and so I get it. You dole each other, and you're useless, and you but you're rich, and so you don't have a lot of needs. And people put rich guys up on a pedestal. But, you know, when you go down the road of what Gilbert Arenas was doing, Bible says uh, Proverbs 13, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So what you're doing is you're actually stealing from your future children, from your grandkids. You're giving it to some woman you wanted to have a good night with. Twenty thousand dollars. You're stealing from your kids. You know it's. That, I, that normally people do care about their children, at, you know, at least to some degree. And maybe they think enough money is enough money. But hey, here's what I think um, happens to NFL players and uh, all, all players. I think think about in college and you and I had a different experience with this because I was around the white fraternities, but white fraternities don't operate the same way black fraternities. White fraternities basically come in and they have the dumbest four years of their lives and then they never talk to those people again and try to forget about those four years. But it's like they act up and, and they're insane. And you can do that during a time where you don't have major responsibilities. And then these guys who, you know, you have your own sort of fraternity in a locker room, but you move into the professional space and you're playing by those same rules. It's just a, it's just a giant fraternity until you're 35. You're rich. You have no rules. Women are throwing yourself, themselves at you. And so you never grad. Would you ever take advice from somebody in a college fraternity? Ne never in a million years would I take advice from any single member of a college fraternity. They have nothing to offer me. And yet that's what we're doing with these professional athletes. We should be treating them the same, truly. I think they have very little to offer us. The, there are the random people, okay? Like Benjamin Watson, a guy that I seriously disagree with most of his politics and a lot of his worldview, but he's thoughtful. And he's a Christian guy that at least tries to operate within a biblical worldview. I think even during his playing days, he had some things to offer to a conversation. He's one in a million. You know, I, I know a guy here in uh, St. Louis. I got to know all the athletes over the years. One of the guys made plenty of money and he's been married probably three times now. He used to get after the games, he used to get a hotel room because he didn't want these women at his house after the game. And just, they would just come through the hotel room. That was pay them off. They leave. You guys each go home, do the next thing, the next game. I'm like, that's the lives these guys are living. And the, the idea that any of us are opening up uh, our children to their sort of influence other than, Hey, watch what this guy does. Don't listen to a word. He says, uh, if you, if they're getting any more than that, we're, we're bad parents here. TJ, you made me think of something as it relates to Gilbert Arenas and leaving your children's children an inheritance. And, and what I can recognize what's going on with Gilbert Arenas, particularly during his playing days. Because I remember myself in terms of when you're the first person in your family that uh, has acquired any level of success or wealth uh, your worldview is skewed. And so I'm gonna give you an example. I can remember, I think it was probably six years into my career in Kansas City. And so 
that, that would have to be around 2000. And I looked at my Kansas City Star 401k uh, after six years of being in Kansas City, and I'd worked two previous years in Ann Arbor, and I think I had between $150,000 and $200,000 in my 401k, I believe. And, 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 and I can remember going, holy cow, look what I've done. <laughs> and it was because when my mother retired from Western Electric after 30 some odd years at Western Electric, she had about 50K in her 401K. And so my idea of what a successful 401K looked like was $200,000. And I was like, look at me. This is incredible, or, or, or whatever. And then it wasn't until uh, I started running around with people of greater wealth that I had my eyes open and like, oh my God, this in retirement, this 200K will last me a year tops. Uh, and if I really want to enjoy a standard of living that I'm used to, I better have a lot more in my 401k and savings than this. But, but because of my worldview had been shaped by the people that I had known, and, and you know, it was unheard of. So Jason's got 200k and a 401k. He, he's beat the entire world in the universe. And, and so that's where Gilbert Arenas doesn't understand, and that's why he's so comfortable blowing through all of his money or a lot of his money because he's sitting there thinking, man, I got 20 million in the bank. He, he has no idea that he could have 90 million or 150 million if he had done the right things with his money, invested it properly and blah, blah, blah. And, and who knows, maybe Gilbert Arenas will see this and be like, man, I do got 100 million in the bank. Well, Gilbert, you probably could have 200 million in the bank <laughs> if you had done things differently. But, but so I, I, Gilbert Arenas, like a lot of athletes, doesn't know what he doesn't know. And I can't be mad at him because he doesn't know it. I just need to put in proper perspective who he is and what wealth does to young people and just people in general, what great wealth does to people in general, and just hold him to those standards that the most wealthy people tend to be complete idiots, particularly those that have earned their money in endeavors that don't create anything. You know, uh, it's not like playing basketball as an individual creates a bunch of jobs for other people. It doesn't cure cancer. It doesn't educate kids. It doesn't, you play basketball. You, you make rap songs, you, you, you sing country songs, you, you act in a movie, and we're paying you 20 or $30 million a movie for what? It, it's, we've given too much money to idiots, and we've made sure that they remain idiots. Uh, let's see, uh, Proverbs 16, this is a living translation, Proverbs 16, 27, idle hands are the devil's workshop. The, part of the reason it's bad that these athletes have so much money is because they have so much money with so much free time. Like these other guys that have built, you know, fortune 500 companies, you don't have a lot of free time because you built a fortune 500 company, right? You're busy running that you, you're handing these guys a hundred million dollars. And then you're like, Hey, go home. It's summertime. It's the off season, you know, get a good workout in today. And that'll take you two or three hours. Idle time will kill you. I mean, it, it's a, it's a bad spot. And you know, you, the Bible's, interesting when it talks about money because you're supposed to leave an inheritance to your children's children and all that but as you said it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven there there are two guys in the bible that you look at that were taken down by women first one's david right david a man after god's own heart and was taken down by a woman right the second one King Solomon was the richest man to ever live and if you've ever read through ecclesiastes like he was taken down by women 
uh, his love of lust of women. He had like, you know, 700 wives and concubines, I think a, a thousand total women. I mean, if the Gilbert Arenas is nothing compared to King Solomon, who, who God told us is the richest man that will ever live. So no matter how many, if anybody becomes a trillionaire, they will not be richer than King Solomon. And that dude wrote Ecclesiastes and said, Hey, all of this is meaningless. Just fear God and honor his commandments. And so that where where we say, hey, we can't blame Gilbert Arenas and whatever. Um, we're, there is somebody to blame because there is a book that tells us all this. So whether it's actually Gilbert or it, Gilbert's parents failed him or all of us have failed someone, th this idea that it's like, we've put you in such a place to succeed. You have a lot of money that you could pass down to your children's children and you could be living a God honoring life. Instead, you're wasted on what do you call them? 304s. I, I, you know, and also giving advice to basically only fans, girls, it's like, Hey, if you really want to step up, get in with an NBA guy. I, I don't, uh, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. I don't, you know, I, what I, I do feel bad when you're talking about his kid, I feel terrible for these kids who are actually taking advice from these guys and they're ruining their lives. And there's so much wisdom in this one book. I, I was listening to Joe Rogan talk to Riley Gaines, um, on, on his podcast. I was listening this morning, but it was last week sometime. And even Rogan is starting to turn. There's been a lot of guys talking to him about Jesus, but Rogan acknowledged with Riley Gaines, Hey, I think the Bible, why he's not a Christian. He's not a real believer. He's like, the Bible was a bunch of people warning us of what was going to happen. If we would just listen to what it says, we'd stay out of so much trouble. I mean, even secular guys, I don't think Bill Belichick is a Christian, but he warned us early on. He's like, look, alcohol, a-holes and women, they will cost you money and put you in jail. So even if you're not doing this for your children and you're not doing this for God, it's just don't be an idiot. It's like people without any real biblical wisdoms can still tell you what's going on. And instead, Gilbert Arenas is telling the opposite to these women to get all of his friends in the NBA compromised. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, glad we had a discussion. Uh, thank you, TJ. Uh, we'll see you later this week. Uh, we'll play tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving all the seed when we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just want.